us because of the um, circumstances we go through sometimes just aren't minor. Sometimes they're just major circumstances that challenge our heart. And so, you know, what makes us, of course, different as Christians is the fact that we're in Christ. Yeah. We've got truth in Christ. And, of course, we're supposed to, no matter what the facts are of the circumstances, we're supposed to find truth in Him, not just from our own human perspective and the judgment for our own heart. So freedom from the judgment of the heart. So who'd like to have this? I'll just give this away. So you're the first Olivia I saw there, so... Oh, got a gentleman's got to help. Thank you, brother. And he's quick. Bye. I'll give this one to you too, brother, if you like. This is how to receive healing from God. I'll let you give this away, brother. Thank you for your help. And that book, in that book, there is about um, ten hours of teaching all together um, in that book, and so um, of course. Uh, I wouldn't have time tonight to, to um, communicate all that's within that book, but um, the intent of that teaching, of course, is that um, to give you insight when it comes to receiving. In fact, um, tonight I'll be, of course, these, uh, through these next few days, I'll be on the subject of the three conditions of the heart. But, um, but it comes to the area of healing in this, what the book is talking about. Really, it's focused on the most consistent area, which is the area of the heart, our heart and believing and receiving the same way we do at salvation. But there, there is some insight into the area of the gifts because when we receive healing in the area of the gifts, well, you, you can see unbelievers get healed in that area. You can see Christians with issues of unbelief still receive from God in meetings where the gifts, the manifestations of healing that come through the area of the gifts, they bypass our heart and how we're believing. And so the gifts are good, but it's the area of the gifts in the body of Christ where the largest percentage of Christians have been losing their healing. And that's not a reflection against the ministries or ministers throughout history that God has used powerfully in that area. In fact, I'm thinking of a lady by the name of Catherine Kuhlman, if you know who I'm talking about in the United States. So I think she passed away in the 70s, but she was powerful in the area of the gifts. Present-day Benny Hinn is very similar to the way the Spirit of the Lord worked through her and how it's, and the Spirit of the Lord is manifesting within his meetings. But there were people healed in her meetings that, um, well, I'm thinking of one person that, um, of course, uh, pe- well, I'll just say this, people that were not even saved, mm-hmm. healed. Mm-hmm. And they definitely weren't believing. In fact, I'll say this, you know, when, when we're ministering during this time together, the Word of God we're ministering, the Word of God is for believers, in other words, unbelievers, you don't approach an unbeliever before you pray for them and say, are you believing? <laughs> They're an unbeliever, and you know, you show them Jesus. I mean, the Holy Spirit loves to show Jesus to people, praise God. But, um, but when it comes to the Word of God, it's a benefit to the heart of believers because it's truth in Christ that is, that is for the benefit of our heart. It opens up our heart to receive. In fact, that's the place of consistency. And when you receive based upon how you believe in your heart, you know what? You just don't give it away through unbelief. And that's what losing your healing is. Losing your healing is never by accident, it's on purpose. Your heart is challenged, and you choose to believe something contrary to the truth of God's word. And when you do that, then it's totally, you know, you can just give something away because you've got a free will. Right out of the area of the heart, right out of the area of the soul, the mind, the will, the emotions, and the choices we make. But again, the area of the gifts, like I mentioned Catherine Kuhlman in her meetings, I'm thinking of a minister that he's probably in heaven now, but um, his name was Jim Spillman. And um, he went, he was a very educated man, in fact, brilliant. Um, I think he had two Ph degrees. I mean, he was so intelligent. And he, but he came out of a denominational background, out of his particular belief system. He did not believe in how the Spirit of the Lord was working through her in her ministry. And so he went there to prove her wrong. <laughs> and he had an experience almost, you think of like Saul, who became Paul. You know, the experience he had with Jesus on the Damascus Road. I mean, it was a life-changing experience. When Jesus shows up, you saw what came out of his mouth. He said, Lord. And, you know, when you experience the manifestation of God's presence... That isn't something that um, comes out of the intellect because he had a total contrary belief system. But God showed up. I tell you, when God, our Creator, shows up, it doesn't matter what's in your intellect. You, you know Him. He created you. And when there's the manifestation of His presence, and so when Jesus, 
he had a manifestation there with Saul. I mean, out of his mouth, he said, Lord. Because, you see, he knew the presence, whose presence he was in. Oh, my. So that's the area that gives. Oh, we have powerful experiences with God. Life-changing experiences, wonderful experiences. But the benefit of the Word of God. That's where we get revelation truth. We come to know God's nature, His true nature and His true character. In other words, personal relationship. We come to know the person behind the promises. Praise God. That's personal relationship. And that is so valuable and so important because that's why I focus so much in the area of the heart and how we believe because receiving is relational. It's about a person. In fact, tonight, when the time comes for our personal time of ministry, I'm going to encourage you that when you come up for personal ministry, for those that do respond during the altar call, that, um, you know, if you need to, prepare your heart so that you make receiving about Jesus, that your focus is on Jesus and not a person to do something for you. I tell you, that's what unbelievers do when it comes to receiving. An unbeliever is looking for another human to do something for them. And that's how they approach someone for help. And that's the way things are supposed to work in the natural realm. So I'm talking right now about the book on how to receive healing from God. Just giving you some of the insights that's within the book. But the fact is this. For us, receiving is about Jesus. But our relationship with God, Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, our mouth confessed what our heart was believing as we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. In Colossians 2, 6, of course, the way relationship began is the walk and the way it continues. It's our walk. It's about Jesus. So receiving should be about Jesus. Praise God. And so when it comes to the, our heart and how we believe, my, I tell you, when you believe, with understanding, not just information, knowledge alone, but with the help of the Holy Spirit, that truth comes alive on the inside, then you're in that process of becoming that truth. You're in the process of taking on the identity of that truth when the Holy Spirit reveals God's Word to you in such a manner that it's not just something you choose to believe because somebody else said it. I mean, you experience the Holy Spirit for yourself, and I believe tonight there's going to be people while I'm ministering that the Holy Spirit's going to speak more to you than what I'm saying. I believe that because it happens. I mean, it happens for me. And I know it happens for anyone. In fact, let me just encourage you before I move on and say this. How do you establish a relationship with the Holy Spirit in such a way that you don't just want Him to help you? You just don't want Him to teach you. No, He is your teacher. He is the one who helps you. Have you established a way of relating to Him to the moment that He speaks? you humble your heart and put his voice at a place of prominence over your voice. I tell you, if you'll do that and value his voice, then and with that heart of humility, if that's your initial response every time he's speaking, if that's your initial response, that heart of humility will just open your heart up to hear because before you rely upon yourself and how you think you feel emotionally, if your heart's already trained to respond to him, because you know the person speaking to you. And you value his voice so much that you treat his words like gold. If that's what's within your heart, then you know what? It'll just be instant. Because the moment he speaks, then it doesn't matter what the issues of your heart are. are. You'll humble your heart. You'll quieten yourself down because you value his help. You know he's got the answers. And so it's, you'll let him be your teacher. Amen. Is there a difference between what you want and what you believe? That's what I'm going to be talking about tonight in that aspect because we're talking about the beliefs of the heart, not just what we want God to do for us. Because again, that's a concept where when you want something, that really means that you really don't see it as yours yet. You really have a distant type of way of relating that you don't identify with as being yours even though Jesus paid a terrible price with his body and his blood to give it to you. And in Christ, you're in that position. You see, it's just the opposite. Receiving from God is just the opposite of how we receive help from a human. With people, you've got something when they give it to you. When it's in your possession, it's yours. But with God, let me tell you, it's about Jesus. And it belongs to us. Before we see the manifestation, we need to identify with it, own it. It's mine. It belongs to us. Jesus paid a terrible price. In fact, I believe it's a benefit to our heart when we take communion to the body of Christ that we really, really 
focus on. Well, in other words, when you take communion, let me say it this way. We're not just talking about a formula, a procedure. No, we take communion, it's about the person. Amen. And it's about his body and his blood. And there's a full significance of understanding when, when we're talking about his body and his blood as well, our righteousness. Praise God. My, I could say a lot about that. My, I could say more. Praise God. But the teaching's back on the table, and then there's some individual teachings back there. You can go to our website as well. But let's see. Oh, let me mention this before I move on so I won't forget. Um, back at the table, we've got the ability, if you want to, um, we can put you on our uh, video email that goes out each week. It's a little short five to seven minute teaching. It's like a little devotional. And uh, some of you, I'm sure, are already on that. If you want to be on that, just give us your email address back there, and then our office will put that on there. And then you can also have the link for our, our newsletters that go out that just gives a little, uh, little, little larger teaching, but it's in a written form that's in there as well, and then just information about the ministry. That's all back there at the table as well. And then I'll mention also this, that... Um, we, um, you know, it's our partners in America that actually um, fi finance our um, coming over here and ministering in all the different countries. We've been in, let's see, 35 different nations all together. In fact, within the United States, we've been in every state in the U.S. And so we do quite a bit of traveling. And so, but it's our partners, those that are part of what the Lord is doing through us. And I know we have partners here in the U.K. We're believing God for a lot more. So if, God, if God's, the Lord speaks to your heart, but it's upon your heart to be a part of what the Lord's doing through us, then I encourage you to go to our website or get some information back at the table because, again, you never have to do anything you get to. Mm -hmm. You should never ever feel compulsion when it comes to finances because the Scripture tells in 2 Corinthians, of course, God loves a cheerful giver. Mm -hmm. And so we're talking about the condition of our hearts. So if you have a revelation and understanding of God's Word in that area, then... Um, that you understand that it's a free will choice. But we're believing God for those that's going to be apart from here so that the finances that are coming from here can support what we're doing and all the traveling and things we're doing for here. So praise God. And um, thank you for praying for us in that area as well. Tonight, I'm going to be talking to you, like I mentioned earlier, about the three conditions of the heart. But tonight, I'm going to start on this first area. And when I'm talking about the three conditions of the heart, I'm going to be talking about um, this area of twice-heartedness, in other words, what the Scripture calls double-mindedness. And then I'm going to be talking tomorrow, beginning tomorrow, about an evil heart of unbelief and what that actually means. And because there's a lot of believers that sometimes think they have an evil heart, but only they don't, or, or don't fully understand the area of, of twice-heartedness, double-mindedness. And so I'm going to be sharing about that tonight. But I'm going to be finishing in the, in the last area on this area of a heart that is a single heart. In other words, a heart that's straight, speaking of the straight and narrow, with truth found in Jesus Christ, and giving an insight into this area, what the scriptures are talking about in this area, in, in this area of receiving based upon the heart. But as I'm starting out tonight, I want to begin with a testimony, because um, this testimony really gives some insight into what I'm talking about and from a really practical perspective. And it's something that just happened within the U.S. right before we flew over here. In fact, my wife and I, we traveled around some of the southern states in, in the United States and ministered in one college and, and, and a few different churches. And, uh, but before we went to our first place to minister, we flew from Colorado, where our ministry offices are at, to, into the state called Texas. Now, if you talk to somebody from Texas, Usually, they'll tell you that, um, well, they'll talk to you like it's their, it's, its own state. It's like it's not, you're not from the U.S., they're from Texas, because um, it's such a big state, and so Texans are very proud of their state. In fact, um, some of our English friends years ago borrowed our vehicle and took a holiday time when they were over there going to college and, and uh, did a drive all the way to Washington to see some of, the, some of our history within the country there. And they went down from Colorado down into New Mexico and then they turned and went across Texas. And they told us later that, see, Texas was so big, they thought they would get across it. And I mean, they sun up to sundown, and it was like they were still in Texas and sun up and sundown. I mean, they were still, they thought they would never get out of Texas. So it, it is a big state. But, but that's the state we flew in to pick up the ministry vehicle. And um, we uh, were picked up a uh, truck for the ministry because it has a multiple purpose for, for there for the U.S. And flying in to pick it up, 
we needed to do some work on the vehicle before we could get on the road to go and minister. So I had to arrange at a particular business to have what's called some running boards put up. And the reason, one of the major reasons I put the running boards on was because um, my wife, to get out of this truck, she she almost needed a parachute. It's like a long <laughs> drop for she's a lot shorter than I am, so it's like long drop for her to hit the ground. So um, so we got some. One of the things we did was get some running boards put on, and then a place that secured all the, everything watertight in the back for uh, when we're carrying other other things in the back for the ministry and things back there. But um, but instead of being doing it at home, we did it in another state, and for that reason, I was stuck at this business and couldn't get away. That, uh, and because I couldn't just leave the vehicle because I had to stay with it because I'm, I'm not from that state. And so um, I'm waiting on them to finish the work before I can continue on. And uh, it turned out it was like an eight hour day waiting on this truck because they had uh, many people doing a, a lot of different things there. In fact, there was an elderly gentleman that came in and this is really the testimony I want to share with you because um, I had been there for hours, maybe four hours or more, and finally he showed up, and um, to him a truck was like a toy. And he got him a new truck, a new toy, and he comes to this particular business with all the little extras you can get put upon your truck. And, of course, uh, they've got quite a number of different uh, fancy little things that can go in trucks. And so he's there to get some of these things put, up, put on his truck. And, uh, but he was a real friendly fella. In fact, um, in coming in, it turned out we were the only two in the waiting area. The waiting area was for like three small round tables. And I was sitting there at the uh, center round table, and he just comes over and sits down, and we just engage in conversation. And he begins to talk to me about some fishing, hunting, different things he's interested in. But in the process of talking to me, all of a sudden, he said, uh, I hope my face isn't bothering you. And, you know, I really never really looked that closely at him. I just, you know, I don't know why it just didn't really stand out to me. But, um, but he told me he had cancer, and it was on the side of his face. And you could, when, I when I stopped and looked, that I could see the growth and see how it was coming out the side of his face in there. And, um, and, of course, my immediate response to this man was, you know, would you like me to pray for you? Now, he doesn't know me, but, he, but you know what? There was an immediate response of yes. Now, I believe, I never did really find out, but I believe he came out of um, some particular denominational background, uh, just in my conversation, that's just the impression I had in talking with him. But he was open to let me pray. And so, you know, I just, with this permission, I put my hand right on that face, right on that cancer, and just release the life of Christ right into that area to set him free to and kill that cancer. You know, you know when, in fact, while I'm at this point, when it comes to prayer, when we're speaking with authority, which was what I'm really focused on tonight in the area of the heart, because when you're talking about the area of authority, it always involves the heart of the person praying and the heart of the person receiving. Both hearts are involved because we each have a will, a heart and how we believe in a free will. Our Heavenly Father doesn't relate to us through manipulation and control. That is not His nature and character. He is love. And so a willing heart is a heart that can be open to him. And this man, he was willing. And boy, I just released the life of Christ. But when I did, then with authority, then the life of Christ being released, what happens when people are getting set free as an example with cancer? When the life of Christ is healing a person, we're not talking about how one human helps another human right now. We're talking about Jesus. He's the one doing the healing. We're talking about the life of Christ setting a person free. Then what is happening when that's manifesting within a human body is this. The reason a person gets better is because cancer just died at the root. It's much just like the fig tree, Mark chapter 11, when Jesus cursed the tree on the way into the city. When he cursed the tree, he was on the way in. But you see, on the way out, Peter, I mean... Oh, just, I mean, they remembered because if you understand the culture, you understand what it means to be a rabbi uh, on that culture. In fact, the disciples, to be a disciple of a rabbi, then within that culture, you watch every single, and listen to every single thing that the rabbi says and does because you're supposed to become just like him. In fact, anything he can do, you're supposed to be able to do. And if you can't, then... Many times the rabbis, of course, 
you know, if they couldn't, if they realized this person, of course, with other rabbis that were different than Jesus. The other rabbis was based on the intellect. They were brilliant. In fact, you could quote any scripture out of the Old Testament, and they could tell you the scripture after the scripture before. I mean, they just were very intelligent. And if the disciple just couldn't measure up to them, they'd let them go, send them back to their father. But you see, Jesus, Peter saw the tree, and he realized, Master, the tree you cursed, it died at the root. He remembered the words, but now he's seeing the physical effect of the words. See, it's a benefit for our heart as Christians to realize that when the life of Christ is released, when you're getting better, it means you're healed. Before you see the fullness of the manifestation, it means you're healed. You see, there's just too many believers in the body of Christ that, I mean, I've questioned them in altar calls when I'm praying for them, and as well as other, I'm thinking of Andrew and others, other ministers have done the same thing. And they'll, when you question them, they won't tell you they're getting better. They'll look at the problem and see that the problem's still there, and that will be their source of truth. They'll tell you, well, no, it's still there. That really reveals our hearts as believers in the body of Christ. It means we find truth in our problems. We're not finding truth in Jesus Christ. And I tell you, it was a little boy he prayed for with autism, and that mother saw that he got just a little better. In fact, we just got another testimony while we're here of a, a child that it's, it'll be wonderful, but um, that um, this, I mean, now he can go shopping with his mother and such just here in the UK that just, just happened. I just got it. the information came in today but, uh, on this trip. But, uh, but the thing is this, though. When that mother saw that he was better and I saw he was better, I told her he's healed. He's going to get better and better and better. Because if, Mo, if, if you really understood receiving from Jesus, then you wouldn't empower the problem. You wouldn't find truth in the problem. You would be focused on the goodness of God. And the very second you see the manifestation of good and you see yourself getting better, you go, man, that's it. I'm free. I'm going to get better and better and better. If that was what was established deep within your heart, if that was your source of finding truth, Jesus Christ. Hmm. But if our heart is trained to relate to life like unbelievers do, to where we believe we have good when all the bad's gone, my, my. I tell you, as Christians, it's a benefit to our heart to realize, just like I was encouraging that man, I was telling him that, my, now look for good, look for physical change. Because you see, it's just like the fig tree. You see, cancer in the human body, the reason it grows, well, it's obvious, it's sucking life from the person. The reason it grows and lives is because its source of life is the human body of the person. And that is evil. Hmm. Freedom is good. But you see, when it dies and a person's getting better, it means it died at the root. It lost a source of life. But you don't want to empower the problem. You don't want to look at the problem and deep within your heart believe you're not free because you don't want to limit Jesus. You, you want Jesus to be your source of life. Again, Colossians 2, 6, as you have therefore received the Lord, so walk ye in Him. If, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. That's old King James language, but again, it's our walk. It begins in Christ, Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, it continues in Him. Now I'm communicating all this area to this man. And, you know, that is normally what in that situation the most I would do. In other words, I wouldn't talk about anything that would cause him to look at himself in relationship to the problem as a minister. I mean, I might even encourage him in scriptures that would be a benefit to him along the line to keep his eyes on Jesus. But I did something, and it just flew out of my mouth, something that I had not planned to do, and I just did it. And, you know, it's kind of like this. I'm, I'm going to be talking to you now about um, the word of wisdom. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 says, The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. But it says in verse 8, For the one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. Now, wisdom, when it's a gift, it's a word just like word of knowledge. 
We're talking about words. But word of wisdom, when it manifests, it's very much like um, praying in the Spirit or praying in tongues, in other words. When you pray in the Spirit, it's transrational. But you are saying the words. And that is the one area that really is a conflict in the hearts of so many believers is that fact that holy they think that well this can't be God because I'm the one saying the words but you've got to realize when you pray in the spirit it is transrational it bypasses a natural mind other words you it's not a known language it's a language that is inspired by the Holy Spirit when you pray in the spirit but when you pray in your known language, you speak out of your rational mind. That's the way it's supposed to work. But when you pray in your prayer language, when you pray in the Spirit, then no, you are speaking the words, but they are being inspired by the Holy Spirit. In fact, when you pray in your prayer language, you're releasing the Holy Spirit to speak through you because stop and consider, where is he? First Corinthians three sixteen, your body became the temple of the Holy Spirit at salvation. Praise God. So you've got the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. Now it's one thing to hear that. It's another thing when that is reality and truth to you. Because you let the Holy Spirit speak through you when you're praying the Spirit, when you're speaking those words. It's the same thing with Word of Wisdom. It doesn't come out of the rational mind. Mm. You don't think first and speak. You just open your mouth and the Spirit of the Lord is inspiring the words in which you're speaking. Mm. The wisdom that He has given in giving. Praise God. And that's what happened. In fact, <coughs> with this man, I did, which I, if I was training ministers, I would tell them, never do something like this. Never say this to a person. I mean, I started talking to him about a lady who had cancer, who chose to die and go home to heaven. It would be like, no, no, shut up. Don't say that. It's like that's the last thing he needs to hear. He needs to be focused on Jesus. Maybe Hebrews 10, 23. Hold fast to your profession of faith, knowing that faithful is he who has promised in other words, a scripture that calls you to focus on Jesus and hold fast to that, your profession of faith and what you're speaking because Jesus, he's faithful. Don't let go. Hold fast. But you see, I didn't do that. I shared about this lady, and I'll just share some of it with you to give some insight into what I'm talking about now because you see, she's a Christian. She, in fact, she, when she got saved, she became a um, Christian that came into the fullness of Soros, the area of the baptism. She had a prayer language, but it was a legalistic church. It was a church that didn't have a revelation of God's love and God's grace. And the leader there did something publicly very harsh and very mean. And she was just a young baby Christian, and she was so deeply hurt over what happened that my, she walked away from church and never went back to church in a day of her life. In fact, her perspective at that time was that Christians are hypocrites. And she became critical and judgmental within her heart towards believers in the body of Christ because of her experience and how she was treated and how wrong it was. Now, this lady kind of went off the deep end but there came a time where she came back to the Lord in her life. And she, but she never went actually physically back to church. In fact, there came a point where she eventually, um, she, she made me like her pastor in a sense at that point in time because now she is elderly, older in life. She's in her 70s. And, um, but she ended up, getting a pinprick of cancer in one of her lungs. The doctor, and it was a young doctor, and he found it. And he said, you are so healthy. In fact, her father 
lived to be about a hundred. And, you know, he said, the doctor said, you're very, very healthy. He said, there's no reason why you can live to be a hundred. He says, this little pinprick of cancer, because it came from, I believe, from smoking, because she's, after that incident, she started smoking again, even though God set her free. And, but he would, she would not let him when he said, look, it's a simple operation. It's an outpatient operation. It's, it's, we can get this out of you with no trouble at all. She would not let him. She chose to die. In fact, um, three days before she died, the family called us. And the reason they called us was this. They all saw angels. In fact, the house had two levels to it. And the younger son was downstairs, and all of a sudden, it was like a... a when they, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> believed was angels and could see the flash of white and the family that was upstairs ran to the bedroom. The son came up, they all ran to the hallway and she was talking to someone in her bedroom. And even as she was talking to someone in her bedroom, they were afraid to go in and they called us because they knew, in other words, there was a presence of the Lord. They knew that something was happening, but they were nominal Christians and they're not used to things like this and they were afraid and didn't know what to do. So we helped them in that situation. And so what happened was this. They went into the mother, and when they did, Jesus himself showed up three days before she died, and she had a wonderful conversation with Jesus. And when she had a wonderful conversation, look, there was nothing but love and acceptance, no judgment. I mean, it was just a wonderful time. In fact, one of the things she said to, to Jesus, she questioned him concerning, Lord, when am I going to go home? And he said, soon. Now, I'm telling this man this story. As I'm telling him this story, you see, all of a sudden, he opened up. You see, Jesus knew his heart. Jesus knew what was on the inside of him when, unless the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me, or, as Matthew 12, 34 says, out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. Unless he speaks, then I won't know what's on the inside of his heart. Because sometimes as ministers, we hear, we hear the issues of the heart coming out, the areas where it can give us focus and direction when it comes to ministering to people. But this man, all of a sudden, this issue, and I'm talking tonight and beginning on the subject here, tonight I'm talking about twice-heartedness, double-mindedness, in other words, is what you see in the Greek language, and twice-heartedness. In other words, it means two different beliefs, and in fact, they're the kind of beliefs that are opposite of each other in such a manner that, as James tells us in chapter 1, verse 8, there is a wavering that has taken place in the heart of the person where they're wavering back and forth between two judgments of the heart, two different opinions, two different areas of beliefs on the inside where they're trying to trust God, but at the same time, get got this issue that's causing them to move back and forth and, and from their own human perspective and such. But you see, this man, this was the issues. What came out of him was this, and I didn't know that until he opened up, but six months prior, his wife had passed away, and he deeply missed her. He loved his wife dearly, and he just wanted to be with her. And when he found out that he's got cancer, and, that, and of course it's growing and, and, and such, you know, he was having trouble just choosing, in other words, trouble not choosing just to go home, but at the same time, his children need him. And he knows they need him, and he's being pulled back and forth between two different beliefs, two different judgments of the heart. Now, there's one thing I want to say here, just for the benefit of your heart and for some insight, and that's this. Double-mindedness doesn't mean you're a bad person. It has nothing to do with your self-worth. It has nothing, because, of course, our self-worth should be established in, in Jesus. And receiving, again, is about Jesus. It shouldn't be about us. But when it's about Him, then it's always easier to resolve the issues of the heart. But this man, these issues, they're not the kind of issues in life that... Um, well, th think about it. This man does not have an evil heart of unbelief. We're not talking about an evil heart. We're just simply talking about life. 
just life itself and the issues that can challenge us in life because he dearly wants to be with his wife. He, it would be easy for this man to choose to go home and be willing to go, but at the same time, he knows his children, they need him. And there's a commitment there with his heart because there's a love within his heart for his children. And so he's being torn between two, and you see, for him to receive from the Lord, truth needs to solidify on the inside to the point that it's the straight, it's the narrow. In other words, a single heart. The thing about a single heart is this. The word single is talking about one, not many. There can be sometimes many issues within a person's heart, the issues of life. Many different circumstances and challenges and things we can walk through. But until truth solidifies on the inside to the point that it's about Jesus, it becomes single on the inside instead of more cerebral, then really we're not at a place of receiving. And this is what James chapter 1, in fact I'm just going to skip down to verse, um, well I'll start in verse 6. Let him ask in faith with no doubting, James 1, 6. For he who doubts is like the wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord. Why? For he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Now, verse 7. If you're not careful, you can read into this, and this can sound very harsh. But in reality, this is not harsh at all. This scripture is given to us with this insight for the benefit of our hearts to help other people. Because you see, this is where Christians get hurt sometimes in life because they don't stop to consider the condition of their heart when it comes to receiving. And because they don't, then there's a tendency to blame God or to wonder, well, God, how can I trust you? You weren't there. Where were you? And they don't even stop to consider the condition of their own heart and how they believe when it comes to receiving from God. This is twice harder than I'm talking about, the issues of the heart. Look, the issues of the heart doesn't mean we're a bad person. It's sometimes it's as simple as just life itself and the challenges and the circumstances of life we go through and the fact that they're having a dominating influence, a dominating effect upon us and how we believe, that's all. Look, in our spirit, when I'm talking about the heart, you need to realize that it, within the heart is your, sp- in that area is your spirit, where the spirit of Christ is at. If you're in Christ, then you've received him, then you've come in a relation with God through Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit's birth of the life of Christ within you, and the very presence of God dwells within you, and within your heart, that's the area of the spirit. But within your heart is also the area of the soul, the mind, the will, the emotions. Because, you know what? We're not robots. It's a relationship of love. And God doesn't relate to us through commitment, and control. In fact, we've got a will within the area of the soul. We've got emotions and how we feel. We have thoughts and how we think, our mind, in other words. In other words, the mind, the will, and the emotions. How we feel about things. You know, as a minister, there's times that I minister to people and they feel their problem on the inside emotionally. And when that is a dominating effect, then many times they don't place a real significance on my words, even though I may take a specific scripture and begin to minister that truth to them. They really don't really listen. Their focus is on themselves when it comes to receiving, and emotionally they're feeling this on the inside, and it's so real within them because the soul is dominating. And when the soul dominates, you're going to limit Jesus when His presence is within your spirit. You've been given all things in Christ, and He dwells within you. You see, if you want to experience the manifestation from within, you yield inwardly to Him. You yield to Jesus, whose whose presence is within you on the inside of you. And the area of the mind, the will, the emotions in this area, man, the thoughts are one thing, but when the issues produce dominant thoughts, dominant thoughts, dominant thoughts, because there is a deep issue within the heart. You see, this man, there was a conflict 
going in on the, on in the inside of him. And it was producing all these different thoughts and he had these emotions and feelings and he's going back and forth. He dearly loved his wife. He just wants to be with her. But at the same time, he loves his children. And so there's a, a wavering, a moving back and forth on the inside. And you see, in the body of Christ, this is how we help people so that they understand that no, the issues of the heart need to be resolved so that you come to the place that you know the will of God in this situation and you know the benefit of God's will. If you can see the good, because let me tell you, God knows what we don't know. And the wisdom he can give us, man, the answers he can give us in life, my, it's a, look, look, he created us. He is far superior and you know, but for our heart to trust Him, He won't violate our will. For our heart to trust Him, it requires a humility and humbleness of heart towards Him in this area. Because, you see, when His goodness is proven to you in the land of the living, where you experience the goodness of God in life, where you receive from God and you receive in such a manner that it's like, God, that's good. It's like, wow, you're, you come to know the nature and character of the person in the manifestation in your life of His goodness when there's a manifestation of one of His promises in your life. You see, there's Christians that have experienced the goodness of God, but they really didn't stop and just keep that for the benefit of their heart and meditate on that continually and remember it to the point that even years later, it's as fresh today as it was then. But in sometimes I've talked to Christians that have and they've been in meetings where there's been powerful manifestation of God's presence or, or, or where they experienced a manifestation of healing or, or just something really good that happened. And they, it's so callous. It's like, oh yeah, I've, I've seen that or I've experienced that. And the, their heart, there's such a callous and insensitivity in that area because you know, it's just something they experienced. But it didn't benefit them to the fullness to prove something to their heart, to prove the goodness of God. I tell you, it's a benefit to our heart when we experience His goodness to hold on to that, remember that, meditate on that. Let it, you know, let the Holy Spirit reveal Jesus to us in such a manner through His goodness towards us that, you know, it benefits us that we take what happened in our life, even in our past, into our future, where we have a heart that is so open to Jesus, that's so open to the Spirit of the Lord because of the experiences that we have with Him. The Holy Spirit will be your teacher if you let Him. John 14, 26, the Holy Spirit will be your teacher, be your helper, He'll help you, and He'll teach you if you let Him. My, it's one thing, again, just to want something. It's another thing to believe for something. Hmm. But if you get it established, your heart is, as Proverbs says, I think it's 6 3, you can write on the table of your heart. In other words, when something by the Spirit of the Lord gets written to the table of your heart that becomes a way of life in Christ, then you take that into your future. Other words, that when I'm talking to you about concerning the Holy Spirit and the goodness of God in, the, in, the, in these areas, when that gets established on the inside of you and becomes a way of life in Christ where you just live it, boy, I tell you, it becomes a part of who you are. Because it's the Spirit of the Lord that turned on the light, as Ephesians 1.18 said, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. I mean, praise God, we can live in this physical flesh suit and experience God in such a personal way that we've got a personal relationship. My, it doesn't have to be religious. It doesn't have to be a lot of formulas or something. But no, a personal relationship with John 10.27, Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. You want to know his voice? Then are you his sheep? Then believe you know his voice before you see the manifestation of his voice. If he said, my sheep know my voice, then don't stop and say, well, no, I never heard his voice. He's never spoke to me. That's all about us and our flesh. That is not establish your heart where, okay, you said, Lord, my sheep know my voice. Okay, I'm your sheep. Okay, Lord, I know your voice, and I'm gonna, my heart's going to be open to listen. Amen. Man, that is a heart that is receiver because you establish your heart to receive. And when you're challenged with the issues of life, you know what? You just don't respect the problems. <laughs> if you respect the problems, you'll put them in a place of prominence. Amen. I tell you, Christians that identify with bad in life, 
can see bad and it can have a dominating influence upon them. And they can look at bad and think all kinds of things that are negative, all kinds of things that are contrary. But the Bible calls unbelief. Unbelief is just simply beliefs from a human perspective, human judgments of the heart. That's all. Beliefs that are contrary to the truth of God's Word. That's unbelief. Praise God. But you see, we're still righteous. Even though there can be unbelief within our heart, that, look, your position is in Christ. You're still loved. It, look, it doesn't change God towards us. It only changes us towards Him because it's the condition of our heart we're talking about. Look, He's greater than our heart. Man, He is love. He doesn't change who He is just because we are going through some issues in life. That's a benefit when our self-worth is established in Jesus instead of our performance. It's a benefit to our heart to know that our righteousness is about, not about how good and how bad we are, but it's about Jesus Christ. I tell you, it's a benefit to our heart so that we're always open to receive because of Jesus, because of His goodness. Praise God. All right. Look, Proverbs 2 says, verse 6 says, For the Lord gives wisdom. From His mouth comes knowledge and understanding. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, But of Him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Now, I'm talking about here about the conditions of the heart, and, um, and I'm talking about the, the wisdom that God will give us. James 1.5 promises wisdom. We can receive answers for anything as long as we're open to receive. As long as there's a heart of humility, we don't ignore our problems as Christians. In fact, denial is not faith. So we don't deny, we don't deny there's an issue. We just simply have no respect for it. We don't put it in a place of promise in how we believe. Because Jesus, His body, His blood <laughs> is at that place of prominence, not the issues of our life. We magnify Jesus for the benefit of our heart and all that He's accomplished for us for the benefit of our heart because the wisdom that we can receive from God, man, we can get answers for anything. There is nothing impossible. But I also tonight want to, in these next few minutes, share something that, um, another issue that, about double-mindedness. When we're t- and from, you know, I, I gave you an example of double-mindedness from the perspective of, well, to issues that are really just the areas of life. In other words, not an evil heart of unbelief. In other words, we're not just ta- you know, I'll be talking about that tomorrow, giving some insight into this area when it comes to receiving, because you see the children of Israel had an evil heart of unbelief. And I'll be explaining what that actually means. But, but there is an example in James chapter 4, starting verse 1. For the second time, I'm just going to encourage you to read it in its fullness. But, um, but I'm going to share specific scriptures just so you have enough insight to understand where I'm coming from and what I'm sharing with you tonight. Because you see, this is a relationship conflict. And as Christians, there can be conflicts in life. In fact, you can see conflicts even in the scriptures. If you, if you understand the scriptures and read about, uh, as an example, how many of you have read about Paul and Barnabas in the book of Acts when the scripture talks about the Holy Spirit spoke and said, separate me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work which I've called them to do. Mm-hmm. Now, they were already called. They knew that God had a plan for them working together. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke and said, separate them now. And the timing now was coming. They were faithful, but the time came to be released into the purpose for the calling and what God had called, had called them to do. But if you look at all the time they spent together and all that God accomplished through the two of them, and, the, and then the strength of them being together, the uniqueness of each individual, and how that together they really worked well together because one person's weakness, the other person's strength, and just, it just really was um, a great team. In other words, ministry is very much a team. But you, but you see, there came a point where there was a relationship conflict over John Mark. And Mark, if you remember, you know, Barnabas was in relationship. That was a family member. But at the same time, though, the first time he and Paul went out together, John Mark let them down and returned and went back. And so... At this point, there became a conflict over Mark because, you see, it was Barnabas 
and who Barnabas was, Barnabas saw value in John Mark. In other words, in Mark. He saw value. But Paul could only remember the last time we were under pressure, the last time there were serious problems, he abandoned us, he let us down. And he lacked confidence in the man, and, and it became such a relational conflict between the two of them that even though God put them together, they separated and went their separate ways. Look, in the body of Christ, there could be relationship conflict, it make, and not necessarily God's will, because God put the two of them together. But even though they separated in different directions, then in life, look, Paul changed. If you look at the life of Paul, later, here he is, and we're talking about years later, and he's saying, bring me John Mark, for he's profitable for my ministry. Look, that tells you a lot about Barnabas. That tells you a lot about the fact that Barnabas, you see, he was capable of working with people that needed the kind of work that even when they fell, the way he related was this. They may have failed, but they're not a failure. He could see value, and he was capable of working in a person's life in such a way to help them put their focus back on Jesus and establish their heart in such a manner that they could effectively operate under pressure. That's the strengths of what was in Barnabas. Paul was just a total different personality. But in time, the man changed. In time, you see, let me tell you something about ministry. It's like, well, I'll put it this way as far as I use the example of the five-fold ministry. Look, it's not about being a perfect person. You're very much perfected on the job. In fact, every single person in the body of Christ is a minister, whether you're called to the five-fold ministry or not. That word minister means servant. Every single believer in the body of Christ can lead someone to the Lord. You don't need a title or a position where your self-worth is, and look at me, who I am. No, you don't need that. You've got Jesus. You've got all you need. You are a minister. You can lead people in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You can pray for the sick. You've got the same presence of God on the inside of you. In fact, you look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. It's the five-fold ministry that one of the areas it says, verse 12, is called to equip the body of Christ to do the work of the ministry. So that means then all of us together are ministers even the five-fold ministry. In other words, we all can pray for the sick. We all, because Spirit of the Lord can work through all of us. My, it's not about a title or a position. It's Jesus. He gets the glory. Praise God. But you see, even though there's a relation conflict, it says in verse 1 of, of James chapter 4, where do wars and fights come from among you? Again, it's, hey, look who's talking from among you. Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members. You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. Now, I'm going to skip down, and there's a lot here I could expound upon, but, um, but uh, for the sake of time here, I want to move on to, the, to this area because verse 7 says, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, he will flee from you. Draw, verse 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn, weep, let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves, verse 10 says, in the sight of the Lord, that he will lift you up. In other words, the heart of humility, the humblest of heart is towards Jesus. Because this is where the answer, this is where your help's coming from, the Spirit of Christ. And so it's an inward thing where when it comes to Jesus, we value His voice. We value the voice of the Holy Spirit because when the Spirit of Christ speaks to us, it's the same as the Father and the Son. They're one. They never work against each other, but they each have their function in our life as far as relationship and how we relate. But you see, verse 7 says there, and we're talking about relationship conflict now because wars, fights, all the issues, the, the, the lust of the flesh and the murder of the covet, all, in other words, all these negative kind of things that could be in the heart of a Christian that causes conflict. I'm going to tell you something. It can be in your heart, in the area of the soul, but it's not in your spirit. And God has value for you. If you can ever, ever get this on the inside of the fact that it doesn't matter how bad the issue is, if you can see yourself in Christ as righteous, then, and the fact that you're loved and you're accepted, 
I'm going to tell you something. You can open your heart to someone who loves you, who's proven their love towards you. You can open your heart to someone who, your heart's a very, very tender thing. In other words, you can't open your heart to someone that's going to go stomp, stomp, stomp. But you can open your heart to someone that is love and has proven their love towards you. That's the Lord. That's God. That's your Heavenly Father. He is love. And it doesn't matter what the issues of life are. If you can make receiving about Jesus instead of our self-worth being and how good and how bad we are, then it doesn't even matter it's if it's a conflict relational areas of life. We're still worthy to receive. We can get His help. Our hearts can change to the point that the problems, therefore, submit to God, the Scripture says in verse 7. You see, it says submit to God before it says resist the devil and he will flee from you. This area of submitting to him is for the benefit of our heart. It's where that soul stops dominating because you're yielding to Jesus and allowing the Spirit of Christ to dominate from within on the inside to the point that we're experiencing the help of the Holy Spirit, where the Word of God opening up, we're receiving wisdom, we're hearing His voice, we're getting answers in an area of a conflict. But you see, you can't hear in an area where there's a conflict if your heart is exalted through unbelief. You'll want something, but sometimes the only way God can speak to you is through another person or through a way that bypasses your heart like a dream or a vision. I can give you examples of what I'm talking about. These are all examples of how God can communicate to us in the Scriptures. And there's other examples, but those the most common way that God speaks is by the Holy Spirit who dwells on the inside of us. Praise God. And that's from the inside. And this area of submission has to do with towards the Lord. It has to do with trust. It has to do with the ability of our heart to have our faith, our trust and confidence in Him, in the person of who He is. And, there's, and you know that, it, okay, Lord, I, I know that what was done was wrong, and I've got all these feelings and emotions and all these beliefs about what has happened and what's been said and what's happened and, and what this person did or that person did or, or all these different things. But you see, if you can put your eyes on Jesus and realize, hey, I don't want to be the problem, Lord. I want my heart to be submitted to you, humble before you. So we begin the process of letting go of the issues, not ignoring, not denying. We're talking about not exalting our beliefs on the inside to the point that we begin the process of humbling our heart in the areas of conflict. I'm using the example right now of relational conflict, the area where there's a willingness for a heart of humility so we understand the benefit will, will, will come to us because He will help us. But if a heart is exalted through unbelief, we're in a place of not receiving this area of double-mindedness because the Scripture says here in verse 8, it says, purify your hearts, you double-minded. This purification process is talking about this area of the soul where it's like we're bringing in line. In other words, repentance is part of that process. So repentance is just a change of mind. So we're humbling our heart and letting go of the judgments of our heart, our own human opinion, and taking a hold of the truth of God's Word and truth that's coming alive, truth that's practical. And even if that hurts, we're letting Jesus heal our heart and take with our hurt the pain because we're choosing Him over ourselves. There's a willingness because we know if we do it His way, we'll get the benefit of doing things His way. If His goodness is proven to your heart, there's a willingness to do it His way because of the benefit. And when you experience the benefit, it's like, you know what, that was worth it. Because the change that comes through the transformation and the renewing of the mind, Romans 12, 2. Yes, there's a renewing of the mind, but there's a transformation within the heart where suddenly you've got understanding, not just knowledge and information. The knowledge of the Word of God has become understanding to the point that all of a sudden you see the benefit of God's ways. It's like, Lord, wow, your ways are so much better than my ways. This is so much better. And something can be proven to your heart that gives your heart confidence in God. Faith is trust and confidence. It builds your heart to trust Him and have confidence in Him. Look, I'm using two different examples here. Just the issues of life. I mean, that gentleman that with those issues where truth needed to solidify, so he'd come to the place. Let me tell you, the effect of wisdom, what came out of my mouth, he realized it's like there's something different with you. This is God. You know, 
as I'm getting ready to go because my truck is ready and, and we'd been talking for hours with all this stuff going on. I mean, he couldn't take his eyes off of me. It's like, it's like God showed up through me. Like the time of Peter's shadow where I was over here teaching students out of Acts on Peter's shadow and I realized I've never experienced Peter's shadow. Do you know what I'm talking about in the book of Acts, Peter's shadow? Because shadow, shadows don't heal people, but the presence of the Lord does. And the anointing and the power of God and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, manifestations of the Spirit was so powerful on Peter that it was already happening. That's what motivated people to run and grab people and put them out there because even his shadow, people were getting healed. And, and so they ran and grabbed people. Just so, I mean, that was powerful things already happening. Look, look, we're not smart enough to come up with that stuff on our own. It was already happening. It was powerful what they were experiencing. And I realized, man, I've never seen that. I've never, and so you know what I did? I just set my heart to believe for that. Do you know leaving the UK, I was down the flight and going down to London, and I had to gas up the car to fly over to Holland to minister, and so before, you know, I had to gas it up before you turn it in, all these things, so. But seven o'clock at night, and I'm pulling this gas station, and there's only one man that came in behind me, just two of us there filling up. I go inside to pay for the gas. I'm walking up to this British lady, and she's not typical British. Her hair's unkept. In a work environment, normally it's more proper. And I mean, her clothes are unkept. She's not even what we call a happy camper. I mean, she wasn't smiling. She wasn't really friendly. And But I'm just there to pay for the gas. I just ignore it. And But in the middle of paying for the gas and, and finishing up, all of a sudden she looks up at me and she begins to express gratitude. She begins to say, thank you. And she begins to be so kind, so nice with me. And I'm going, I mean, I'm, I finished up and I was sitting there going, what just happened? What did I do? And the next customer walks up behind me, so I move out of the way. And I walk, but I, I didn't leave the store. I stop and I'm watching this. This lady, she's like night and day different. She's like over the top friendly and kind with this man. And I mean, the man's being courteous with her, but I mean, she is just like being, I'm, well, let me say, I, I suddenly I saw it. What happened was this, when I walked up to pay for the gas, within a matter of seconds, she began to feel, she felt the presence of the Lord. And then when just a matter of like a few seconds or whatever it was, 10, 15 seconds, whatever it was, all of a sudden the anointing, the life of Christ, wham, set that lady free from depression. And she knew it had to do with me. That's why she was expressing gratitude to me. And all I did was set in my heart to believe for Peter's shadow that, Lord, man, when people are going to be healed just in my presence because of your presence dwells on the inside of me. Mm. I mean, he worked through Peter. Now, I shared that with an American pastor as soon as I flew back to the U.S. because I was supposed to call him on the phone. And so I, was, I just told him about what happened. Do you know the first thing that came out of his mouth? It really revealed his heart. It wasn't jealousy. It wasn't comparison. It wasn't anything about himself. Instead, the first thing that came out of his mouth was this. He said, I'll believe for that. Do you know within two weeks he experienced the same thing? Because he said that and his heart backed up what his mouth said. My. You see, he realized, listening to me, man, all you did was say you'll believe for it. He did the same thing. He said, I'll believe for that. Here is it, church. He's going to pray for this lady, but he gave her the microphone because she's sharing a short testimony. She handed the microphone back to him. She said, I don't need you to pray for me. Standing here, I was healed. Wow. Now on the way home, his wife begins to talk to him. His wife said, "Hun, when so-and-so was healed standing next to you, the Lord spoke to me. I don't understand this. It doesn't make sense. Does this make sense to you? The Lord said, Peter's shadow. He said, Oh, I remember my conversation. You know, he'd forgot about our conversation. But what he said, he said from the heart, isn't that the goodness of the Lord to remind him of the fact that here I'm fulfilling what you said, you believe from the heart and you're receiving? Man, if your heart were back up, your mouth is saying, my, this is what we're talking about tonight. I'm beginning this area of receiving from the heart, and I'm talking about the areas of the condition of the hearts, the three areas concerning double-mindedness, twice-heartedness, an evil heart of unbelief, and what that means, and then singleness of heart, a single heart before him, a heart that's just open to receive. We'll be given more insight into this area. But you see, receiving is about Jesus. We're going to be given some insight to this area more, but, but the scripture here, draw verse 8, 
or verse 7, submit to God, then resist the devil and he will flee. You see, if you'll submit to God through the process of your heart changing, experiencing the Spirit of Christ and His help, then your heart will back up what your mouth says. You'll discover that the demonic realm, they're not stupid. If they, and I'll talk more about this tomorrow, but, uh, but you see, they can speak your language. They can communicate with words that you'll listen because it's the way you think. It's your thoughts and it's just the way you communicate. It's the words that have potential influence upon your heart. But you see, when you submit to God, then you're different. You're a different person because you become that truth that's revealed to you by the Holy Spirit, the truth of God's Word. You become that truth. And then your heart will back out your mouth is saying, and then you resist the devil and he will flee because you see, you can't be tempted where there's no temptation. When your heart changes, it's like, phew, he, he, you know, he has no inroad. He can't dominate and influence you. The, look, the devil has no new, no tricks. Jesus defeated him at the cross. Amen. And the democracy in their time is short, and they know hell was made for them, and they're going to be punished because they're evil. All they do is hurt people. They are evil. There wouldn't be all these problems on the earth today with all the wars and famines and death and everything else there is if it, if it hadn't been for Satan. Look, he is evil. There's nothing good in him at all. And God is good. I might. But cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. And to speak, and the hands ha- talk about our actions. And you, you know, because again, you can sin, but it doesn't mean you are a sinner. It's just talking about the fact that a Christian can sin, but you, but you are who you are in Christ. That's in your spirit. But just because you're sinning, in the context of you're talking to the person, a person is sinning. In other words, they're a sinner because they're sinning, but you're not that. That's not who you are in Christ. And so purify hearts, you double-minded. Lame, mourn, weep, and laughter turn to mourning, joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. I tell you, any issue of the heart can be resolved, even conflicts, relational issues. And I tell you, we can change and we can have truth found in Jesus Christ be established within our heart that is a benefit to our heart to where we're different. And it's just like, in that area of life, it's like I can't be tempted there anymore. We're a different person because truth has been established on the inside that is now a benefit to us and is going into our future. We're relating differently. We're a different person. When you're talking about relationship issues of life, or you're talking about the double minus that just come for the issues of life. Not, in other words, not a bad person. But truth it needs to solidify because you see, again, that's where Christians get hurt is when they're, they don't understand the condition of their heart and they wonder, well, God, I prayed. Why didn't you do it? And they, there's this kind of emotion and feelings and thoughts and beliefs on the inside that, well, how can I trust you? You let me down. But they don't understand that receiving is about Jesus. It's not about us, but it is for us. And we'll be talking about that. Because when receiving is about Jesus, it's true found in Jesus Christ because He's the one that went to the cross. We didn't go there. He did. But we're in Christ and we're crucified with Him. And so in Him, for all the promises of God, Second Corinthians, for all the promises of God, in Him are yes. In Him are amen. So they're not automatic. Jesus. Receiving is about Jesus. We're going to be giving more insight into this area. Tonight, I'm going to encourage you that um, if you're here tonight, you've gone through different areas of life. The same anointing that will heal you physically, Jesus. He'll heal your heart. He'll take away the issues to the point that there's grace. There's an able to build the Holy Spirit being released to you. Praise God. If you're here tonight and you've come for some area concerning a physical manifestation of healing, I'm going to encourage you. And again, I've said this, I say this before, but there are you see, what I've discovered is this, that the Christians in the body of Christ, I can say this, but it doesn't mean it's become a way of life in Christ for you yet. And a, and a person will always, under pressure, respond back to what's on the inside. Mm-hmm. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. But the fact is this, I'm going to encourage you, if necessary, take a few moments and prepare your heart. You don't have to be in a hurry. In this conference, we're going to be going on all day tomorrow as well, and then tomorrow evening. And so, you know, it's... It's, it's not beneficial to continually get prayer with nothing happening. 
it is beneficial when you get results. It'll prove something to your heart. And so when your heart straightens out and you can see things for yourself, not because someone else is saying so, and you experience the Holy Spirit as your teacher, and you get answers for the issues of life, the issues of the heart, man, it'll give your heart confidence. You'll come to understand, Lord, you weren't, you weren't, you, you weren't responsible. You didn't let me down. You'll come to understand that receiving is about Jesus. It's not about us. It's about Him. It's what He has accomplished for us. My. And give a heart confidence to seek out wisdom and understanding where you never have to feel pushed and rushed and in a hurry because it's relational. You've got relationship with a person. And if it takes one second, one minute, one hour, one day, one week, or one month, or one year, look, the end result is going to be good. And the only reason there's a length of time in anything is always because of us, never because of Him. Because it's our willingness to humble our heart before Him. And sometimes it's just not easy to do. Some areas of life, we, if we believe we're right, we just don't humble our heart on the inside, or we just hold on to our issues. We just don't humble our heart. But He doesn't change towards us. That's the good news. That give your heart confidence that no matter what choices and decisions we've made in life, He hasn't changed. He's still love. He's, he's always there. He is love. Praise God for His true nature and character. My, praise God that God is love. First John chapter 4. He is love. He doesn't just have love. He is love. I'm going to encourage you tonight that if you come for personal ministry in any area, then to make receiving. Just put your focus on Jesus. Make receiving about Jesus, that you're worthy because of Him, not because of how good and how bad you are. If you're not, you have an established relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Look, that's more important than anything God will ever do for you. That's talking about eternity. And look, every single one of us, this life is temporary. There hasn't been one human that stayed here yet. Every human has left this planet that's ever been on this planet. And eventually, if you haven't left yet, someday you will. <laughs> it's just a matter of time. But we live forever. It's just not in these physical flesh suits. But God, our Creator, the one who made us, look, these flesh suits are temporary. But the real us is on the inside. Praise God. And our future. Look, God did not make hell for man. He made hell for Satan. In other words, those angels that chose to follow him and turn against a loving God. My, he made, he, hell is made for them. Humans are not supposed to go there. My, but if you choose out of the deceit and deception of the devil, choose believing that it's just you making the choice and choose to reject God, you have a free will to do that. But I'm going to encourage you tonight to open up your heart to a God who loves you, your Heavenly Father, your Creator. If you haven't come into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, I'm going to encourage you tonight to come. Come and receive because that is more important than anything. That determines your future for eternity. That is the best decision you'll ever make that throughout your entire life. That is one decision you'll be so glad you made. Praise God, you'll never regret it. In fact, you can blow it financially. You can blow it relationally. You can blow it in every area of life. Man, but you see, you can win if you're in Christ. Because you've got a future. You've got a good future. You've got Jesus. You've got a God who loves you. I tell you, in life, that just doesn't make sense to a lot of people because, man, you go get a job, it's about performance. If you don't perform correctly, you might lose your job. If you're working for someone, in other words, if you're working for yourself, you might sabotage your, you know, your company or your future without that area of performance. And performance means so much between people and how we relate between each other. But I'm telling you that our Heavenly Father is love. And yes, He can see the mistakes we make, the weaknesses, the choices, the decisions in life. But you see, if you know His love, then there will be a willingness of your heart to trust Him and open your heart for His help. He'll never change. But if we choose to reject Him and choose to walk and do things our way, then we just get the result of our ways. But He doesn't change towards us. I tell you, that is love. That's, I mean, think about our, par our relationship with our children. If our children have to be perfect to be our kids, it'd be like, hmm, there's something wrong with our heart. It's like, okay, that's it, kid. I'm trading you in. We're getting a new kid. It's like, it's, uh, back, I'm going to look for a two-for-one special. It's like, no, no, no. No, they're, look, no matter how good, how bad, it's relational. It's relationship we're talking about. I tell you, if you haven't, 
come into relationship with God through Jesus Christ, accepting Jesus from the heart and, and accepting Him that all your sins have been put upon Him and accepting Him as a sacrifice is the best thing you'll ever do. Praise God. My. Well, we're going to open it up for personal time. I'm going to ask the ministers to come forward tonight that's going to be ministering. I know you're hiding. You're somewhere. Thank you. Okay. As these guys are coming on up. Yeah, come on up. Be bold. Just come all the way up to the front, guys. It's fine. Come on up. Just act like you know what you're doing. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. No, these guys have been